back again, back again, and this time it's with another Mavericks victory. They are now 8-2 on the road this season, and they get this in a 118-97 shellacking, second half shellacking of the New Orleans Pelicans. Now this is a game wherein you didn't have to play a minute in the fourth quarter for Luka Doncic, for Kristaps Porzingis, or for Tim Hardaway Jr. Your top three scorers were able to sit out the entire fourth quarter because this game was completely decided in the third quarter. And for Dallas, that's huge, obviously, being this is the first night of a back-to-back. -back. The fact that they now come back to Dallas to play the Timberwolves, that's that's good to get rest like that. Only 28 minutes for Luka, and he still gives you freaking 33 points and a career-high 18 rebounds. He did that in three quarters. He shot the ball ridiculously. He only had five assists, but he had teammates miss at least six or seven potential assists for him in the first quarter alone, it felt like. Luka shoots nine of 18 from the field, five of 12 from three. I mean, he was he was making pretty much anything he wanted happen in this game. And this was this was an interesting matchup for Dallas because... The Pelicans still without Zion Williamson. It sounds like he is finally starting to clear his first hurdle in terms of his recovery, but he's nowhere near ready to come back. There is some real question going on there. Are they just being super cautious or is there something more significant to it? I don't know. All I know is after this next game against the Pelicans later this week, we're done with them. So really interesting to see how we're going to miss him in all three of these instances. But all the same, I still think the Pelicans are a pretty good Pretty good team uh, in terms of the talent they have. They are fourth best in the league in terms of three-point percentage, I believe they said, during the game. Uh, they also are a team that loves to push the pace. And in the first quarter in particular, you really saw that. Dallas was a very sluggish start offensively. Dallas came into the game averaging 13.2 turnovers per game. That is the lowest rate in the NBA. Unfortunately, in the first few minutes of the game, they committed five turnovers. So you're immediately looking at that and saying, huh, this trend is probably going to change a little bit. That number is going to tick up just a little bit. But it really didn't. I mean, in fact, no, no. For the game, Dallas committed 12, or excuse me, 10 turnovers. 10 turnovers. They had five in the first five minutes. That's that's incredible. Uh, for the Mavericks in the first few minutes, while things were not working offensively, turnovers and things like that, I know this is a game where his his name's not on the board, so there's going to be people who want to you know kill KP figuratively, of course, uh, for a bad game here. But KP was a big difference maker on the defensive side of the ball uh, in the first quarter. I mean, he had four blocks in the first quarter alone, ends with five for the game. Now, it's not a, a big game for him in that regard, 18 minutes. He had some foul trouble. He came in. He got his third foul early in the second quarter, sat out pretty much the entire second quarter. I think there was like... 10 minutes and change left in the second quarter when he had to exit due to that situation. And then when he came in in the fourth quarter, or excuse me, the third quarter, he picked up another quick foul within the first couple minutes again. And then it was just like, all right, well, now we just use him if we need him. And hey, you didn't need him. So he was able to rest a significant amount, less than 20 minutes for KP. He gets you seven points, six boards, one assist, only two of 11 from the field. He's really struggling to find his shot right now, so hopefully... I'm glad he's still being impactful in other ways. Again, five blocks. Uh, he's doing work in that regard, so it's offsetting some of the bad that you're seeing offensively while he tries to find his shot. I just think Dallas needs to figure out something, uh, something to get him going. Now, one thing, if you were watching the TNT broadcast, you would have heard... Charles Barkley and Shaq talking pregame about, oh, well, the answer is to put him on the block. Put him down on the block and let him go to work. Are you guys even paying attention at this point to what KP's skill set is? KP is the second worst player in the league in terms of points per possession on post-ups. I think it's like 0.61 points per post-up for KP. It's the second worst rate in the league with a minimum of, I want to say like 20 attempts. I mean, it's been garbage this year. Now, that's not to say you can never incorporate that into his game again. I'm just saying you're literally advocating for putting him in his worst situation right now and saying, hey, this is how we're going to get things going for you. No, dude, come on. Don't be ridiculous with that. But all the same, I digress. Uh, this was this was a really good game for the Mavericks. As a team, they knocked down 19 three-pointers. 
It wasn't necessarily clicking in the early going. At the end of the first quarter, we were knotted up at 24, and Dallas was shooting only 27%. And again, with five turnovers, the fact that they were tied, I mean, that that was fantastic for Dallas. I mean, that was the best possible case scenario you could have envisioned. And that had to be frustrating, you would think, for the Pelicans, because they were playing good. They were playing with pace, with tempo, like they like to do. They were making plays. They were they weren't shooting the ball especially well themselves, but they were forcing Dallas into these bad turnovers, and it wasn't hurting Dallas at all. That so for the Pelicans, that had to be a little bit uh, demoralizing for them. But all the same, Dallas was able to get things corrected in the second quarter. They end up taking. I want to say off the top of my head. Wait a minute. I got the screenshot here showing me. Uh, I believe they took a six point. Yep. Six-point lead into half, 59-53. Dallas is uh, one of the best scoring offenses in the league. I think they're in the top four still in terms of points per game. And you had a feeling that even though K- or even though Luka was the only guy really working for the Mavericks, you had a feeling that they would be able to find some rhythm in the second half. And really what gave them the spark in the second half of the second quarter was J.J. Barea off the bench, man. Like, we haven't seen a whole lot of J.J. Barea this year. And again, he's 35. He's coming off a torn Achilles. It takes time. And he, he's he's healthy. But I think when I say it takes time, I don't mean time for him to find his rhythm. Because obviously that dude is instant offense off the bench. Pretty much any time Dallas has called on him this year. I think it takes uh, a little bit of consideration from Rick to say, hey, do I want to use heavy minutes on J.J. this early in the year? Or understanding his age and everything else, his health and everything, would I rather try to, you know, keep him in the loop reasonably well, but then save him for when we get hopefully to the playoffs? And that's the obvious answer because J.J. Barea is the only guy on this roster with championship experience. The last remnant, I believe, in the league overall from the 2011 championship Mavericks. So, yeah, it is it is crazy uh, to think about that, first of all, but it's crazy how Berea, no matter how few of minutes he gets here and there, how few of games he appears in, you put him in there and he's instant offense. In this game, in, the, in that second quarter alone, I want to say he got about eight minutes, or maybe it was seven minutes, I think, in, the, in that quarter. He had eight points, six assists, three of five shooting, and two of three from three. I mean, the guy is instant offense. Now, he got a couple more minutes in garbage time, but it didn't really matter in that regard. It was the very, very end of the game. So, Berea had himself a day. And that's why I put him on there, actually, instead of KP, even though KP, uh, well, his stat line is more full. But I wanted to highlight Berea specifically in this case because this is one of those games where you saw not a lot was working for Dallas offensively in that first half. He flipped the switch for him. And then in the second half there... Uh, Luca takes over just basically every board falling to Luca. It seemed like the fact that he had 33 and 18 in 28 minutes didn't even have to play the fourth quarter. I mean, this is this is one of those things too. There are some people who are going to say, "Hey, we want all these accolades for Luca, right? We wanted his first 30-20 game in that regard, 20 rebounds." And if if he had wanted it, he could have easily had it. But the thing is, we're playing the long game here at this point, right? If this was a team with the record like last year's team then we wouldn't be thinking in that regard necessarily. We would be more so like, all right, yeah, you want to chase those you know, those little accolades here and there, those personal records? Sure, fine, whatever. But that's not, what, that's not the position we're in at this point. Dallas is 14-6 and six on the year. They are in, uh, coming into the game, they were fourth in the Western Conference. I'm curious now, I mean, it's going to be a tentative situation just because of the obvious fact that uh, it, it's a half game difference and it's the middle of the night here. Dallas still sitting in fourth behind the Clippers, Nuggets, and Lakers. So yeah, 14 and six have won three straight. They are three games back of the Lakers, uh, just a half game back of second place at this point. So Dallas is doing a lot, a lot of good things here. They've got some good momentum. I understand there's some frustration with uh, Porzingis and his, his struggles, uh, but you got guys who are coming through here. Tim Hardaway Jr., He's regressing slowly, I think, back to the median after about a week stretch where he was just instant offense for the Mavericks. He did did pretty well in this game. 5 of 11 from the field, 1 of 3 from 3, 12 points for him. His median is about 14 to 16 points, I think, and I think that's what you're going to get. If you go back the past month, he's averaging about 18 points. So 
yeah, he's he's in a situation like that where he's slowly regressing back, and that's to be expected. But as long as you have some of the other guys on the bench step up, you should be able to continue your success as a team. Uh, and you got that tonight from Seth Curry. 19 points, 4 boards, 6 of 11 from the field, 5 of 7 from 3. You saw late in that game, it looked like he was really starting to get some of that swagger back with some of those shots. It didn't matter how contested he was, how crowded things were. He was knocking down threes with a hand in his face, with a guy in his grill. Did not matter. And that's that's one of the reasons why, even though he's had a little bit of a slow stretch here for a while now, I've continued to say I am a big believer in Seth Curry and what he can bring to this team. You, can, you don't add a career 44, I think he's 43% right now, but a career 44% three-point shooter with as much... Um, with as much success in his past and, you know, at the age and everything he is, you don't add a guy like that and he just falls off a cliff. And his falling off a cliff is shooting about 34% coming into the night from three. So, yeah, that's still better than Dorian Finney-Smith, who's shooting a career-best 33% at at the moment. Uh, That does not include tonight's game. I didn't even look at Dodo's uh, attempts in that regard. Let's see here. 0 for 3 from 3. So that, that dropped down just a smidge. But regardless, you have guys like that. You have weapons at your disposal. They're going to start to come through. Even Justin Jackson shooting like 46.7% from three entering the game. And this is why for my article for Clutch Points, my first Mavericks article for Clutch Points I wrote today, uh, I basically specifically spotlighted how, you know, everyone's focused on Luka and for good understandable reason. But what makes the Mavericks so dangerous isn't just Luka. It's the fact that, as KP starts to find his offensive rhythm again, you're adding another then all-star caliber player to the mix. And the bench is getting so overlooked. It's in the top five benches in the league in terms of points per game in plus minus terms on average. I think it's first or second maybe at this point. The bench gave you 53 points tonight. I mean, fantastic production from the bench and that's going to help you win a lot of games that's going to keep you in these situations where you can afford to rest Luca and KP and them the entire fourth quarter because you have that benefit of knowing hey if I if I have to hand off the ball to this next guy it's not like I'm just coming over here to take a couple minute break during a TV break or something, and then I got to go back in and keep carrying the load. No, you're able to hand it off, and most of the time, be fairly well assured they will keep things in control. I don't know necessarily that, at the very least, they'll keep the game kind of in check where it is. You've seen stretches where they've struggled a little bit, but when things are firing on all cylinders for them, it, it doesn't matter. They're going to keep the game where it's at or even potentially extend it like you saw tonight in that regard, obviously. Dallas winning by 21 points. They weren't up 21 at that uh, point when Luka came out. I mean, they were already going up big, but extended a little bit in garbage time. So let me see here. Let me see. Dallas for the game shoots 43%, out shooting the uh, Pelicans by 3%, so 43 to 40. Three-pointers, Dallas very good tonight, 42%. 19 makes, as I said earlier, just 27%. 11 makes, uh, for the Pelicans, 27 free throw attempts. They go 23 of 27 for 85 percent. That is a quality number right there. The Pelicans 10 of 15 for 67. Mavericks again five turnovers in the first five minutes. Only five more the rest of the game. That is fantastic protection of the of the ball of your possessions and all of that. Assists were on the low end again. Luca only had five for the game, but Dallas still outsisted the Pel- assisted the Pelicans 22 to 20. Out-rebounded him as well, 51-47, 10 offensive boards compared to 9. Eight blocked shots for the Mavericks. Again, KP leading the way with five, four for the Pelicans. Not too many fouls, only 14 fouls as well. So there's there's a lot to look at in this game and be pleased with as a Mavericks fan. Uh, for the Pelicans here, you had Ingram with 24 points, five boards, and six assists. Eight of 16 from the field. He really looks like he is doing well with this change of scenery from LA to New Orleans and with Zion out it's actually allowed him to be more of a focal point for them and I think that's done a lot for his development so that's kind of a silver lining for the Pelican situation there Drew Holiday uh the only thing I would say for the Pelicans man there are a lot of minutes for some of these guys they don't they don't have the same minutes distribution Drew Holiday 37 minutes 
18 points, four four boards, four assists on eight of 18 from the field. Not a good not a good day at the line. I noticed two of six at the at the stripe. That's not very good. JJ Redick, quality three point shooter, coming most of the time on good teams off the bench. In this case, uh, a starter for them. 14 points, six boards, four assists. 5 of 15, 2 of 8 from 3. Not his typical quality there. Lonzo Ball. Uh, Lonzo Ball, man. It's a weird world where Lonzo Ball attempted 10 three-pointers. He did knock down two of them. And I keep hearing, like, hey, his his shot's really coming along pretty well for them. Uh, Okay, I mean, it was a busted-ass shot form and technique anyway. But uh, it's a weird world where you got Lonzo Ball taking 10 threes. That's one of those things where it's just like, it's an aberration. It's unusual for me to see and process. Uh, also, he was 2 of 12 from the field. So 6 points, 6 rebounds, 3 assists for a guy that was given a lot of hype coming out of the draft uh, in his particular year. So uh, not a whole lot else to spotlight there. I mean, this is this is a good win for Dallas. I'm not going to harp on this too much longer other than to say I'm pleased with this win. They're 8-2 and two on the road now. They have been very, very good on the road. Their two losses being New York and Boston. Only one game in this year have they been just thoroughly outplayed, that being the Clippers game. That was a game it felt like they never really had any real grasp or control of beyond the first quarter. Uh, you could say the Boston game got away from them late, and they were getting kind of handed handled at that point. And, of course, you could point to, like, the Knicks games as well where they were you know thoroughly in pursuit pursuit mode but those games at least were close in the closing minutes they got into clutch time when it mattered the Clippers game didn't matter and Boston started pulling away with about the about the time Dallas and them got to uh, clutch time within that last five minutes or so was when Boston started pulling away so Dallas has looked really good there's not really many teams that they just can't do anything with. When you protect the ball, when you got Luka shooting out of his mind, uh, entering the game, something like a 63% true shooting percentage. Uh, When you got him averaging for the month of November, a triple-double, a 30-point triple-double, only the third player in NBA history to do that behind Oscar Robertson and Russell Westbrook, you're going to make some serious headway. And that's why I said, this bench has been so overlooked, but we talked about that in the offseason. That was a real strength of this team. And if they could actually, if they could stay healthy, they could build upon that. And it was a little bit slow going initially, but you're starting to see it now, even without a true third man, they, they have so many guys that you can throw out there on a given night and say, all right, you're the third man tonight. Your shots falling. You're the third man tonight. Usually it's going to be Tim Hardaway jr. But you'll see nights like this where it's more Seth Curry. Hell you'll see nights. I'm hoping just based on his production. Sometimes you'll see Justin Jackson give you those kind of performances as well. And, uh, of course, you got an instant offense spark plug off the bench like J.J. Barea as well. You've got so many different guys who, on a given night, can fill that role if need be. And on some nights, you're going to get multiple uh, multiple of them stepping up and giving you kind of that third-man production, which is to say uh, shooting a pretty solid percentage and giving you something like 15 points roughly a game. If you got Seth and Hardaway doing that, you're in good position. So check that out. And uh, I'm, I'm not... I'm not going to sweat um, this KP game. It, usually he comes on strong in the second half uh, of games, and obviously he barely touched the floor in the second half of this game. So I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to choose to focus instead on the positives, the five block shots and the way he was altering other shots um, and all of that. But that's going to do it for my time on this video. Thank you guys for tuning in. Don't forget to like the video, share, leave a comment below. Uh, I've been DDP with the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Salute.